So we've got a number of people still streaming in here, and I'm just going to let the last few kind of stream in, and then we'll start here in about two minutes. There's some spots up here in the front, like front mid. So great, we got a few still trickling in, but I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, I've got quite a few slides to hit. Um, just going to start by. Uh, Pointing out a couple things. Our topic is Drupal 8 plugins. Hopefully, it's what we're all here for. If not, please stay. Um, if you would like to tweet anything about it, I do always kind of have a session tag for this. If not, that's OK, too. If you're just so engaged that you can't type on your phone, I will not be offended in the slightest. A um, little bit about me. I am Chris Vanderwater. Uh, I'm uh, Eclipse GC on uh, Drupal. Uh, actually, used to be developer evangelist at Acquia. That is not my title there anymore. I should have updated this slide. My apologies. Um, I am a technical specialist at Acquia, specializing mostly in Drupal 8. Um, I was the Scotch initiative owner for Drupal 8, so lots to do around plugins. And I am one of the co-maintainers of CTools and a number of other things. Um, before I get uh, too far along here, uh, who in here has installed Drupal 8 at this point? <laughs> who in here has started writing a module for Drupal 8 at this point? Of those of you who are writing modules, how many of you run into the plugin system? And that's why so many of you are in my room. Okay, cool. Um, so let's talk a little bit about plugins. I'm kind of a tell you what I'm going to tell you, tell you, tell you what I told you guy. So uh, we're going to cover a number of different topics here. Uh, first, we'll start out with what is a plugin, because I feel like there are a lot of misconceptions just around the topic in general. Um, we'll talk about why it exists, because I think that is worthy to know. And then we'll get into some of the benefits, some of the foundational concepts you're going to need to have to even really begin using and leveraging plugins. And uh, given enough time, we'll look at some code and what it looks like to uh, maybe create your own plugin um, or the basic structure of very simple plugins and plugin types. Uh, before I continue, though, I want to throw out a big thank you to Hellier Colorado. Um, if you all don't know Hellier, he's a great member of our community. He and I have kind of bounced this same sort of presentation uh, back and forth a number of times independently and figured out we had largely the same presentation. Um, so just for uh, his efforts here, also educating around this, and also uh, Joe Schindler, who I don't have in this, um, these guys have done a really great job communicating about plugins as well. So let's talk about what is a plugin. Um, I'll start with Hellier's definition. Uh, so Hellier says it's a discrete class that executes an operation within the context of a given scope as a means to extend Drupal's functionality. Um, that is absolutely accurate. I think it's also uh, kind of dense. So I took a crack at it. I think it's a discoverable class, and we'll get into that topic here very shortly, uh, that implements a particular interface 
Who in here knows what an interface is? Good. Yeah. Um, which adds or extends functionality to a pluggable subsystem. What is a pluggable subsystem? Anybody want to guess of one like Drupal 7? Yeah, any, basically any info hook is probably what we would think of as like a pluggable subsystem, okay? So going through my litany of things and just kind of breaking it down, number one, it's discoverable, okay? Uh, that means that we can find it somewhere. What, what is an info hook? An info hook tells you that something exists, right? This is the notion of discoverability. It's actually uh, kind of unique to Drupal. It's object-oriented, which it would have to be if it's going to implement an interface, right? Um, and it's swappable. Uh, most plugins, if they implement an interface, obviously you have a contract there. Um, they can be substituted one for the other, right? That's exactly what these classes are. Uh, and I think very notably and very interestingly, uh, the plugin system is, uh, while it's a requirement of Drupal, Drupal is not a requirement of it. So if you learn plugins and you really like and enjoy plugins, um, it is my hope that shortly after we release Drupal uh, that you'll see a subtree split of certain things that have been built during the Drupal, Drupal 8 cycle and uh, you might be able to get plugins through a simple composer statement, like composer install Drupal plugins, right? Anybody playing with composer? Good, 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 good. Okay, so uh, why did we invent this? So we've talked a little bit about some of the older structures and what this is replacing. Um, it's worth noting that we looked around at an awful lot of um, existing code outside of Drupal. And increasingly what we found out is that Drupal sort of is a special snowflake, which we all suspected. Um, but most systems really don't have the level of configurability that Drupal does. Like if you download WordPress, yeah, it's got some configurability to it, but it's nowhere close to the same degree as what you're gonna find in, in a Drupal install. Um, so there was a, a very large absence of any sort of similar code like this. Um, and I think it's worth talking about frameworks here because frameworks don't expect this at all. Uh, if you were to download uh, like Symphony Full Stack, yeah, it has uh, bundles which you can download and install kind of like our modules, but these are hard-coded literally at the PHP layer. You literally say, I want to turn on this bundle and this bundle and this bundle like we would with, with the extend page turning on modules, but instead of it being configured and stored somewhere, you literally write it into the PHP code. You're specifying which bundles you're gonna include. And this is kind of stereotypical for a lot of frameworks. They don't necessarily have any sort of user interface that turns things on or off or allows people to configure things for a number of different options. So some of the benefits of plugins. Um, who in here has ever opened up a, an info hook and then needed to open up some other file or some other function that that info hook was referencing and you had to go back and forth or you had to turn your screen into split screen mode, right? This is probably pretty typical if you've done any sort of development in Drupal on something requiring info hooks um, or hook menu. Hook menu is a great example where we say, oh, here's your page callback and now I have to look at my page callback and see what were my load arguments, what parameters did those come from, these sorts of things. Um, and so, you know, stereotypically the block info uh, hook. Uh, this is system block info. I'll just point out a couple of quick things about this. Um, that right there is the powered by blocks info declaration, right? It says, like, here I am, Drupal, you can place a block now. Um, and what's it do? We, we have, like, this other hook that we have to go implement, um, which is hook block view. And hook block view has this ginormous switch statement that says, which block are we trying to render? Oh, powered by, you want this code. Right, So every single block that system module cares about, every block it could render is all in one function, which is basically the worst thing ever. Um, so we don't, we don't do that in Drupal 8. Drupal 8 looks something like this. This is this, the powered by 
block in Drupal 8, right? I have one method. It specifies what the render array is going to be. And at the top of it, all of that green text that you can't really read, that's an annotation. That literally is my info declaration. So it all exists in one place, all together. I can see everything from a metadata perspective about this plugin, and I can see what it's going to execute. No split screening, no anything, and generally pretty small files too. We'll get to that here in a little bit. <coughs> so it's probably obvious from the last screen, but plugins are object oriented. Um, these are just a few of the block hooks that you have to implement in Drupal 7 and earlier. So if you want a block, you have to implement the info hook. But that's, that's not a block. It's not going to render anything. You can place it all day long, but you're not going to get any output because you have to know that you need to go and create hook block view. If you don't know that, you don't get any output, period. End of story. If you need to configure this in any sort of way, then you have to also have the hook block configure and hook block save. If you don't have both of those, then you don't have a configurable block. It's not going to save anything. And you can only place one of them, so you better get it right the first time, right? <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> in Drupal 8, we're backed by a real legitimate interface. So um, these are all the methods that exist on the block interface, and I'm just going to keep using blocks for the most part. There are many, many plugins within Drupal 8. Um, but every last one of these can actually be implemented by our base class. So unless you need to override it, the only thing you have to tell us is how you want to render. Right? You write one method. You write a little bit of code at the top of it, a little bit of uh, metadata at the top, and that's a block. Any questions before I go on? No? OK. Um, so block, the plugins are extensible. You can actually in, inherit from a base class, or you can inherit from some other class. Um, so if you like the login block, but you want to make a much better login block, you can extend that class and have your own login block that does all the same things, but is styled totally differently, right? Um, no more need to copy someone else's hook and put it into your code and maintain it separately. We get the, the full benefits of OO as a, as a language construct. <clears throat> now, I'll just point out that I've lied a little bit. You know, this is, I said this was the powered by block, and it is, but we added a couple extra methods to it for caching later, so... When you open it and you see that it's not that small, it's because we had to override a couple of things for the powered by block because it's always cached. Okay, fine. Uh, plugins are lazy loaded. Anybody know what that means? Like when I say that they're lazy loaded? Okay, a few of you. Um, w for those of you who don't know, which is the vast majority of the room, uh, where do these exist? If you have to implement these, where do they exist? Your module file, that's right. Uh, is your module file always loaded if that module's running? Yeah, it's always in the memory footprint. Okay, so uh, that, that doesn't happen in Drupal 8. Um, we'll talk about auto-loading here in a minute. But in Drupal 8, we actually have individual classes for every single implementation. And we only load those classes if we need the classes. So if that block is going to be rendered on the page, then we load it. And if it's not, it's completely outside of your current running memory footprint. Uh, these are all the system blocks, just as an example. <coughs> and uh, this one's super important. Plugins are a common pattern. They are learn once, use everywhere, case in point, um, here are all of the plugin types that I could find in core a year and a half ago. There are more now. Uh, that's 37, I believe. There are well over 40 at this point in core. Um, I will show you how to find those here in a few minutes because that has been a question in the past that is uneasy to answer. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about some like foundational Drupal 8 kind of concepts that you need to have a handle on or at least know exist 
uh, before plugins are going to make any sense, really. Uh, Autoloading. We talked about autoloading just a little bit before. Who in here is familiar with the specifics of it as far as Drupal 8 goes? <coughs> Great. Um, <clears throat> if somebody says lazy loading to you, they also kind of mean the same concept. We aren't going to load it unless we need it, thus it is autoload or lazy loaded, right? Uh, so for the rest of you, PSR0 and PSR4 are super technical jargon for how we autoload things. So um, PSR0 says something really simple. It says your class has a namespace on it, Drupal core maybe, and that maps to a directory, core, lib, Drupal core. So if I ever see a class whose namespace starts with Drupal core, I know that it's got to be in this directory or some subdirectory thereof. Cool? Make sense? Same thing with Drupal component and many of our um, third-party vendor files as well. Um, but that's kind of verbose. Like, we know it's Drupal core. Why is Drupal core in the directory structure? So there's also another one called PSR4. And PSR4 basically comes from this same notion, and it says, okay, so you have this Drupal block namespace. I don't need to have Drupal and block in there. I just need to know what directory to look in. So it knows core modules block source. And inside of that directory structure, if it ever sees anything that starts with Drupal block, it looks there. And so if there's a plugin in there or a manager of some sort or any interface, that's where it's going to find it. Um, and so this reduces the number of directories we need in order to tell Drupal about something by two, which is really nice. Uh, dependency injection. Who in here has ever dealt with dependency injection? Ah, good, 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 good. Um, so this is like my, my good, bad, n not great example. Um, so if you, if you ever find yourself creating a new class in a constructor, chances are you're doing it wrong, right? Um, you, you actually have a dependency on that class for you to run if you're declaring it in your constructor, right? <coughs> What's better is to pass it to your class. And so this is this notion of dependency injection. We use this all over core. Um, but this can be very difficult when you get multiple dependencies upon dependencies upon dependencies. Like if the bar class required a baz class and so on and so on, that gets really difficult to instantiate. So we have this whole other crazy thing called service containers. Anybody gotten to play with the service container layer yet? Okay. Um, we adopted Symfony's service container for things, and it's actually pretty elegant in the way that it does stuff. Um, it allows us to document that we have uh, certain classes that are available to be used as dependencies, and so any of those classes that also have dependencies um, on each other, they can begin to document. So this is my condition manager, which is another plugin type, and it's specifying that uh, it has a, a parent that it's just going to inherit from. If we were to look at that, you're going to see that it specifies some arguments. Those arguments are all going to be other service definitions for the most part. So if I look for container namespace, boom, there it is. Declared, says exactly what it is. <coughs> Apparently I should have water. Mm, I'm sorry. Um, same thing with cache discovery. Uh, you know, each one of these declares the class that they are, they declare any sort of arguments they take in, tor in order to instantiate, and so on, and so on. Here's the module handler. And this is just like one small chain. There are some that can be quite dense in terms of the chains that are there and how, how um, many levels worth of autoloading you have to look at. Um, so this is how we declare all plugin managers, though, so that we can actually get things like the namespaces put into us, and we can get the plugin manager so that we can do alter calls and, and that sort of wonderful thing. Annotations. Uh, so if you've made it this far into plugins, then you've probably nearly got it working. Who's built a custom annotation at this point? OK, way less hands. Uh, custom annotations are like your info hooks, right? Um, so in a lot of ways, they can just be kind of like an array that has um, various keys and value pairs. Um, 
What's really great about them, though, is that they are completely customizable to you, the developer, who might be creating a new plugin type, right? So while blocks want a fairly limited number of things in their annotation, uh, something like the content entities can be very dense in terms of what they take. So, you know, the entities are specifying what sort of um, handlers they have for storage and access and view and all sorts of that sort of stuff. They can specify what their base table is. They can talk about their entity keys. And um, dependent upon your use case, you are probably just going to get this back as like an array of data. Uh, entities actually deal with this as an object. But what's cool is that a full object does actually back you up on your annotation. And so now you have a place to document all those keys that we couldn't really document inside of an info hook. Like, Page callback, what does that mean? How many of these are there? Where can I find a canonical list of every single key that could be in my info hook? Like, that's actually really hard, and we've worked really, really hard on various uh, Drupal sites in order, on, on various Drupal.org sites, in order to document this for people so that they can see, oh, here are all the, um, you know, the form keys that I could use. Here are all the menu keys I can use, and so on and so forth. But in Drupal 8, you're actually backed by an annotation class that tells you right up front, here's every single key you can use and what it can be used for. We can also set defaults in these so that you don't have to specify every single one of them all the time. If there's the same default that you can apply for um, people using your plugin type, you can absolutely do that. So um, before I hop into actually doing some code here, I want to point out a couple of quick things. Um, <clears throat> one, annotations are not code. Uh, if anything, they're actually much more akin to a serialization format. Um, and this is kind of reinforced by the fact that there are a couple of different situations in core where you'll actually find plugin annotations uh, defined in YAML instead of in the annotations of the class. Uh, a couple of examples you may have already run into. Has anybody set up a menu item, local task, local action, anything like that? Did you know you were creating new plugins? No? It's pretty well hidden, um, but those are actually plugin definitions, right? Uh, so when you create those new YAML uh, um, entries, you're creating a new plugin definition. You can actually specify the class that that's going to run through and take complete control over what happens with that menu item that you just defined. Um, that may seem sort of weird, but if you were to look at like taxonomy menu in Drupal 8, it runs um, all of its code through a custom class and um, can do quite a few extra robust things because of that. <clears throat> I said that already. Uh, so my primary point here is that, um, you know, annotations are, they're data, they're not behavior. If someone says, oh, you're coding in comments, no, you're really not, right? Um, info hooks were kind of commenting in code, if anything. Uh, so <laughs> let's look at a couple of practical examples. I know that the slides can be a little dry, so I'm going to hop into um, some real code here, and we'll uh, show some something hopefully a bit more tangible. Does everybody see that okay?
So I invented the simplest plugin type I could possibly come up with, which is literally just something that DSMs out a message to people on the site. Um, so this one has a very simple message. It says, roses are red. I suspect you can guess what this one says, which is just simply that violets are blue. Um, and these are two specific plugin implementations of what I hope is the simplest plugin type in history. Um, so let's kind of dig into this and begin like really looking at it. I'm actually going to Awesome. Can you all see that okay? Oh, yeah. That's pretty good. Okay. So um, a couple of quick things of note. Uh, one, our class actually implements an interface. Okay? If it didn't implement this interface, then it would not be discoverable in the strict terms of what Drupal defines as discovery for this plugin type. Um, number two. It has an annotation. The at message specifies that we have an identifier of blue violets and we have a label that is translatable, also of blue violets. Um, and the translation system will just pick this up and it treats it like any other string within Drupal. Okay. Um, and finally, uh, and most importantly, um, is where this class actually exists. And so it exists within a particular directory structure inside of our module. And because it exists in that directory structure, implements this interface, and has that annotation, it's a plugin of the type that I'm looking for, right? If all three of those things were not true, this would not be available to be chosen inside of the plugin system. Now, to kind of back that up and show how I know that to be true, I'm going to go ahead and go into the plugin manager for this. Now, I'm at a distinct advantage on this code because I wrote it. Um, if you happen to be looking at a plugin type that you did not write and are trying to figure out how do I write a new one of these, the first thing you have to do is you have to find its manager. If you don't know what its manager is, that is absolutely positively your first task all the time. And once you have found its manager, and we'll talk about how that can be done, um, you want to look at its constructor, because its constructor is going to tell you a number of things, right? In our case, um, when it calls parent construct, it passes a directory. It says, look in the directory, plugin, message. This is going to iterate over every namespace in the entire system for plugin message as a subdirectory. Um, is everybody familiar with namespaces? I've said that a lot and not explained it once. Um, namespaces are these guys. See how it says namespace Drupal plugin message up there? That's the module in which this code exists. Um, and so every module registers one of these. Every Symphony component registers one of these. Drupal registers a few of these. And these all get passed to every single plugin manager as dollar namespaces. And it'll iterate over these and check for a subdirectory structure of plugin message. And if it finds it, it knows that it might have plugins that are eligible for this content, for this plugin type. It then goes on to see whether or not they implement this interface. We talked about the interface. Here it is. And finally, it specifies the annotation. So. The plugin manager is responsible for setting up all of these uh, kind of bare minimum, you have to do these sort of things. Um, and what's especially interesting about this is that uh, while annotations are kind of the order of the day for most plugin types, uh, they are not the only one possible. I already mentioned YAML. Um, discovery is completely pluggable. So if you wanted to write your own discovery system that, I don't know, hit a service endpoint on someone else's system and let you do crazy things, you could absolutely do that. Discovery is absolutely 100% pluggable. So is the factory instantiation. And so plugin managers, from a very technical perspective, are actually factories with a dictionary applied to them. Okay, So they know everything they could possibly instantiate, and they have the facility to instantiate them. That's what a plugin manager is. I'm going to stop at this point. Are there any questions? 
We've got mics over here if anybody does want to ask a question. Um, just feel free to walk over there and I'll stop and we can talk. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, so, yeah. So the question was, um, if, if discovery is pluggable, can you describe why a system like um, the menu system would have gone with YAML instead of annotations? <clears throat> and uh, that's pretty easy um, to kind of summarize because in that particular case, almost every single menu item runs through the same plugin class. Um, so if you don't specify a class, its plugin manager applies a class for you and just assumes that this is the one you're running through. Because of that, they didn't need to attach annotations to classes in order to operate. They just needed to document yet another set of metadata to pass through the same class over and over and over again. Um, it's reproduced throughout the entire menu system. Um, menu links do it, menu actions, menu tabs, all of them do it, and it works really, really well in that case. It's kind of um, an odd use of plugins, but I really like it. I think it works really, really well and very elegantly. And it gives um, other systems, again, like Taxonomy Menu, the ability to come in and provide their own, uh, their own logic in that sort of case. Um, another kind of point on that is we haven't talked about derivers, but uh, who in here has ever written a for each loop inside of an info hook? Yeah? Did any of you wonder how you might do that with an annotation? Yeah, so we, we actually have a separate class that you can define that defines the for each loop to run the annotation through. Um, I don't show that in this particular one, but if someone wants to see it, I'd be happy to, to show it. Um, so I saw another hand over here. Did someone have an additional question or did I answer it? No? Okay. Great. So, um, so our plugin manager is really responsible for making sure that it finds our plugins and that it um, can instantiate our plugins. I'm going to go ahead and hop into Drupal here. Um, this is my administrative interface for this really simple module. And it gives me an option of selecting between my two plugins or no option whatsoever. So if I were to select red roses, I can go ahead and hit save on this and I'm gonna get a message. Roses are red. Okay, cool. And if I wanna change it, I'll get violets are blue and of course I have caching issues. So. I get both for the first refresh, and then after that, I'm good, um, because this is a really simple module. Now, this module's public. If anybody wants to take a look at it, it is a plugin underscore message on drupal.org. I have done my best to keep it as simple as possible so that people can really easily dissect it. Um, but uh, coming back in here for a minute, <clears throat> Let's go look at the annotation. We've looked at most of the other aspects of this, but the annotation I think is um, especially interesting because it's so simple. It didn't have to do much of anything. I extended a base class that Drupal core provides for this and I just documented the extra stuff I wanted, which was one thing, label, and it's a requirement. So I didn't give it any sort of default. I documented exactly what you're expected to do here. It's an administrative label for this message. I couldn't possibly be more clear about what it is that you're supposed to do inside the annotation of your class now. So coming back to one of our classes, we can see I add, well, ID is actually assumed in all plugins. I didn't say that, but it is. And then, you know, you have a label that should be a translatable string for administrative purposes. We can also go into the interface just to kind of do diligence on this. And you can see, as promised, this is potentially the simplest plugin type in the world. It has one method. It has one string in the annotation. It, it's so stupid that it almost shouldn't exist. But I think it, it is educational in nature. 
So, now I mentioned that these are supposed to replace info hooks. Um, and one of the common things that we see with info hooks is that they typically show up in a user interface somewhere, right? You have a block to place, you have, you know, input formats to configure, you have something along these lines, right? And so the plugin system allows us to do this uh, pretty simply um, by calling the get definitions method. Just call get definitions and it will find if it doesn't already have every single instance of plugins for this plugin type and then it caches them. So it doesn't parse annotations every single time you like go through this page. That doesn't happen. Parses them once, caches them. Uh, if you need to add new ones, you're going to need to clear cache. Um, and you can specify all of that stuff from inside of the um, inside of the manager. So I'll come on back to our manager and point this out again. The manager sets a cache backend interface, uh, sets a cache backend with what was passed to us through dependency injection. And then we give it a particular string so it knows, oh, I have a separate cache for plugin messages right here. The other thing worth noting is that we also happen to have a alter info hook. And that means that I'm actually exposing every single annotation across the entire system to an alter hook so that someone else can come along later and start changing things about my implementation. So if I didn't like the label that was on a particular plugin implementation, I could change it as a developer for my single site. And 99.9% .9 of the time, if you're going to do this, it's probably going to be on a site-by-site -site basis because you want to change something for the customer. Um, I've, I've found one situation where that might not be true, and we can talk about that in a second. But I want to actually show this because I think it's kind of interesting. Taken to its logical um, end, that means that I could also do something really nasty, like replace the actual expected class. Uh, so you'll see I've put the red roses class here in for the blue violets plugin. And of course, I closed terminal. So I'm going to clear cache. Yay. And after I've done that, well, that didn't work. <laughs> ah. When I refresh over here, you'll see I've got blue violets selected, but I'm getting the red roses message. And that's because the red roses class is now running for all instances of blue violets. So you remember I talked about maybe doing your own thing with the user login block? Um, I've always told people, like, if you're going to do something like this, it's probably on a site-by-site -site basis, and I stand by that. But I was talking to um, the guys who are trying to upgrade two-factor authentication, and they're like, oh, no, we actually do need to replace the user login block with a custom class that just takes it over completely so that we can do appropriate two-factor right there on Drupal's normal login block. Is like, oh, well, crud. There's like an actual use case for that. Um, and so if you need it, that sort of stuff is, is actually there to support you and is really ridiculously powerful when you realize I can actually take every configured instance of this block throughout the entire system and swap the class it's going through without having to reconfigure anything. One alter hook, clear cache, boom. Every single block of that type that's out there and running it's running a completely different class than it was moments ago. Uh, let's see, what time is it? I don't know. Okay, so we've got about 15 minutes. Uh, if there are more questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I'm going to start showing really crazy crap. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, yeah, if you needed to do it, that would be the way to override, override the behavior of a plugin. Just you know, do me a favor and don't do it in contrib modules. Like, don't contribute modules back that do that unless there is literally zero, like, zero other way to do it. Yeah, yeah. And it's only if the um, plugin manager actually provides an alter hook. The vast majority of them in core do, though. Then, well, well, if it doesn't provide it, um, the service container that we talked about, every single one of those services and all of Drupal can be hijacked and replaced with your own class. Like every last service definition in the whole thing is technically pluggable. As long as you put another class in there that has the same interface on it, Drupal will keep running. Oh, no, 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 that, that would be changed at a different layer. You can actually um, specify that you want to hijack an existing container definition and point it at a different class, and then it instantiates that class instead of the one Drupal defined. So you could hijack the plugin manager that's there and put your own plugin manager in and do whatever you wanted to that entire plugin system. Uh, the, yeah, the question was, since I already answered it, <laughs> um, is this how you would overwrite uh, a plugin's behavior? And yes, in general it is, and most plugin managers provide an alter, so. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, so the question was along the same lines, um, can you use this sort of an approach to override um, entities or entity forms or things like that? Um, so you'll, yeah, you can read that. Um, so you'll notice this handlers right here. Uh, handlers specifies all sorts of various things, including form, which happens to point at a particular class for the default. Um, yes, this is all available to you through alters, and you should absolutely positively be able to change it. Um, entities are interesting in this regard because um, most plugin types, their annotation actually returns an array of just their data. And in the case of entities, they actually return an object, um, but they have a really great set of methods on there that also, I believe, expect you to be able to alter some of these things out. So something like, especially a form, should be very changeable. Um, so if you didn't want to go with like a typical form alter and like manually alter each individual thing and you just wanted to hijack the whole class, sure, like that should be doable. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Um, in oh, the, this should be good. <laughs> in the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned something about, um, you gave a little overview of the different plugin types in core, and you, I think you said that you'd explain how, you, how people could figure that out, and we built a solution for that in the plugin module in Contrib, and I was wondering, did we do something that someone else already sold before? Uh, yes, um, however, sure. I, I don't think you're gonna be upset about it because the people who, who solved it already um, are are the uh, here. plugin manager interface. Yeah, uh, I was just gonna come here <laughs> and uh, scroll through all of the different plugin manager interface implementing classes. So no, from a PHP perspective, whatever you invented is probably great. Because I'm just using PHP Storm, right? But that's every every class that implements a plugin manager interface, right there, which is quite a few. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, if you define an annotation and all of its properties, are they all required? N yes and no. Um, if you define it and you don't give it a default value, it's required. If you give it a default value, because you could say like protected dollar whatever equal empty string, that's not required, right? 
Um, if you just say protected dollar something, you need to provide something for that. The plugin class? Yeah, you could, but you're you're unlikely to extend anyone else's annotation. You might extend the the one that Core provides, um, and that just comes with an expectation of ID, which you have to have. Um, otherwise, we can't instantiate stuff for you. Uh, but you're unlikely to ever extend someone else's. Uh, the only system I know of that does that is entities, and they share a common base class. So config entities and content entities actually have two different annotations, but the plugin system is looking for their parent class as the annotation, so it picks up both of them, which no one else does anywhere in core as far as I know. And it's a cute trick that I wasn't even sure worked until I saw it working. So other questions? Okay, well, if anybody comes up with one, just raise your hand. Um, I'm going to have a, a little bit of fun here. Um, <clears throat> so my job at Acquia, as of late, has largely been helping to support various contrib upgrades of, um, of Drupal modules. So Drupal 7 modules we all know and love and trying to get them up and running inside of Drupal 8. So this would include things like taxonomy menu, which we just um, helped get a beta out of pretty recently. And uh, the one that no one has really gotten to see yet that I've been working on for about the last week and a half is services module, um, which, yes, we have some cool stuff in core, um, but I needed a slightly different approach, so we needed a different module. Um, so I'm going to show a little bit of that and maybe show off some of the more nifty aspects of um, plugins that this session doesn't normally cover. So I'll start with um, a fairly easy thing here. Um, anybody in here actually ever use services module? Yeah, that's a pretty good chunk of the room. Um, one of the things you can do with services module is you can say like, hey, I want you to like serialize a node into JSON and give it to me. You're like, okay, great. So that would be like get in the rest terminology. And so what I have here is I actually have a class whose job is to get an entity and return its data as an array. And um, there's some, some really cool things kind of going on here. I'll start up at the annotation because the annotation is almost the entirety of this. You'll see there's exactly two lines of functional code in this plugin. Two. Right? Um, so, okay. What's going on here? Um, I have an ID of entity get. It specifies its method, so it's saying we're doing a git. And then it has this deriver on it. I made mention of doing like for each loops inside of an info hook. This is what derivers do. So this is a completely separate class whose job is to know what to for each over and how to complete the metadata for this class. Let's go look at that. So this guy actually gets the entity manager injected into it, and then it for each it for each is over every single entity type defined not only in core but by any additional module you might have installed here, right? Like if you had Drupal Commerce installed, it would find all of Drupal Commerce's entities as well, okay? Um, and so it goes through and it begins setting up derivatives for this, where it specifies a title, a description, the category of the thing, a unique path at which to actually address it. And then it sets up something um, that we haven't discussed at all, which is this notion of contexts. Now, contexts are data objects that your plugin requires in order to run. Uh, anybody in here ever use panels? <coughs> okay, so panels has kind of this notion that um, I need a node if I want to tell you what the title of the node is. So if you want to place the node title in this region, I can't very well tell you what the title is if I don't have the node object. That's a context, okay? Um, 
So I decided to leverage the same sort of idea with services. And so my, my service definitions all say, well, I'm currently looking at node or user or comment or wherever we are in the for each loop, and it specifies I'm going to need one of those in order to get it for you. Okay. Anybody want to take a guess where it gets that? The path. Right? So Drupal Core does this. If you want a node and you're on node slash one, node one is, is your node, right? And Drupal has this awesome system where you actually get a node object out of that, right? In various iterations of Drupal, it has been more or less awesome. It is fantastic in Drupal 8, but I'm not going to go there right now. So I've specified I need this entity. I'm going to get it injected into my plugin. And so I can say, hey, get the context value for the entity we defined as a context and then return its values as an array. In practice, let's see, I'll bring up Postman. Ha, there we go. It looks a little something like this, right? So I have JSON output of a node object. Here's JSON output of a block, right? <clears throat> I can see that this block is currently in footer second. And then we can start doing some cool things. Let's see if I can pull this off. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I don't think that happened proper. No, 500 error. I definitely screwed it up. But the whole idea here, of course, is that I can pass this stuff off and actually get it to update all across JSON or XML or whatever it is that I'm doing, right? And so this is actually really, really powerful, these notions of derivatives, because I wrote one class in order to do get for both blocks and nodes and users and comments and orders and your entities will work there. Right? You use the entity system. I have a driver that iterates over the entity system. It just works, right? Um, and so, like, learning derivers, really cool. Learning context, also really cool because you get to actually start making um, these dependent upon the objects that you need in order to operate. And you don't have to manually get that. You don't have to say, oh, well, this is going to be node post or node put, and I know I'm going to need to serialize this thing as a node object and manually write that code. No, Drupal has a serializer that can look at JSON and figure out how to turn that into a node for you. Who knew? Right? And so I don't have to actually specify node anywhere in my code, and because of that, I get a lot more out of it. Um, I think we are right about at the end of time. Um, looks like we have maybe five more minutes. So, yeah. Um, yeah, just the first thing that to me is, what happens if, like, circular, so that one came along and made the module, like, creates an entity for every snake sample or something? Oh, yeah. So you have this circular dependency. Yeah, so, so uh, the question's, like, functionally... Couldn't I do something awful with that? And the answer is yes, you could. Um, as, as an example of one that I didn't even think of, uh, it wasn't until I was standing in the hallway demoing this to some friends that I realized services actually had all the knowledge it needed to create new service endpoints across its own API. And I was like, oh, oh, do I, do I want that? I don't know if I do, right? Um, which is why it's nice to have these alters that you can just, like, throw crap away with and be like, nope, I don't want that. You know, I'll manually alter that out. Um, so, you know, we still have alter hooks in, in Drupal 
Uh, we probably shouldn't. We should probably have done it some other way. But we do for the time being, and they work, and they work really well. So I would encourage you not to do something awful um, unless you just really cannot be stopped, in which case make a dependency on bad judgment and go have fun. Other questions? No? Okay. Well, I'm going to let you go a few minutes early. And uh, if you have any additional questions, feel free to come up and ask me. Never say, never bring up Portland ever again. I like your take on things. Oh, well, we did, we did um, kind of a collaborative one of movies, and I made all the slides, but we never got to go over it as a group. So it, it, at some point, it broke down into a love fest about PHP Storm, and I don't think we ever actually recovered from that point. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Well, I think what's what's more interesting to me about that particular topic is that like that slide that shows all the ones that are in core, which isn't even all the ones that are in core. I helped I helped create like maybe four of those. Like four, and there are like ten times that many in there. Right, so other people obviously like picked it up and ran with it. We we brought it in because we knew we wanted it for blocks and we knew we wanted it for block visibility via conditions. That was why we needed plugins. And we were like, if no one else uses it, so be it. That didn't happen, <laughs> and that was great. Anyways, your question. Yeah, it's just kind of an It's, it's more like it's like uh, saying, oh, the behavior for this particular type of thing exists over here. It's not behavior in the annotation itself. It's documenting where it exists. Yeah, I guess so. Because <clears throat> like, from a separation of concerns perspective, we don't necessarily want that behavior in our plugin. Like, I wrote the plugin system three times. And the first two, I tried really hard to get derivatives as methods on the actual plugins. That just never stuck. It never worked. It was always crufty and ugly and made me want to, like, shoot myself. And, you know, it wasn't until, like, the third time through with a lot of oversight from some other.